Maybe a change that you guys haven't noticed or felt yourselves, maybe unless you have children, that they're starting video editing a lot younger. A lot younger. And it, there are some tools like, you know, this is the iographer for the iPhone. Like, you don't need anything anymore to, to, be, to get started. Okay, so how much younger are we talking about? Uh, two years in a row, I flew to Maui and taught a five-day film editing, uh, film creating workshop to middle school kids. So these are kids, I mean, think about how young that is. That's sixth grade, so they're 12 years old. This is like they're barely out of biting each other <laughs> and like scratching each other, and they're making movies. So we broke this class up into five groups of kids. We made five movies, so like The Value, Silence, uh, See You Later, OMD, and Movie Night. Those are the five movies that this class created. And this is a real script that the students wrote. We worked on it. And that's the students really filming. They're actually editing right there out in the field. They were, were required to use you know, multiple camera angles. I brought them slates. They now have slates in Hawaii. And of course, they're all editing on Final Cut Pro. I don't know if, if many of you have had the Pleasure of meeting Norm Holland. Um, he was a teacher at USC who unfortunately passed away last year, or this year actually. Um, what he, he told me the last time I spoke to him was that it used to be that you could be a high school kid who had never picked up a camera, never picked up editing software. You were just a really bright kid. You know, maybe you got uh, good grades and you could apply to USC and you could get in. And now you can't unless you have this filmmaking background already, right? This is actually a huge shift because there are now huge disparities between what opportunities high school kids get just based on where they live and what room they walk into. This is a high school, I think it's in Calabasas, I can't remember exactly, but I was there, this picture is recent, it was last week or last month rather. This school has every, uh, they have more than 20 Mac Pro, uh, iMac Pros. They have a lighting grid on the ceiling. They have enough cameras for every kid who wants one to use one. They have a VO booth. They have a sound um, room. They have an avid certified instructor as a teacher. Editing is the next literacy. And I, I literally mean like reading and writing. I think that knowing how to make a video will be a skill that every single person is going to have to know how to do to perform their everyday work functions. And if you look at the list of questions, I mean, this is really what we were doing with the middle school kids. You know, who's the main character? What do they want? You know, how is that really different than an English paper, really, if you think about it? And in fact, um, I like to say video is the new poster board. So you guys probably had to make poster board presentations when you were in high school. Well, nowadays, kids are all making videos. And those videos aren't just for TV class. Those are for science class and math class and um, for every class. Who realistically thinks that they could watch like 100 videos on how to play the guitar, and then at the end of it, just pick up a guitar and just be like, yeah, I got it now, yeah. right? That's like completely impossible, OK? And, and actually, the big misnomer is that you can do that with a book. That if you, oh, oh, well, don't read the, don't watch the tutorials, read the book. If you read the book, then you'll be able to do it. And that is nonsense too. Okay, so reread the book. Yeah, that's the way we study. We reread the book a million times. That is also not the way you do it. The way you learn is by actively doing something. And the reason is the process of trying to remember how to do it and the process of failing at doing it is the thing that creates the memory. So what Edit Mentor is, it's software, specifically it's an NLE designed to teach and learn editing. And it focuses on the creativity aspect of, of learning editing. Right now, all our editing training, or the vast majority of it, is created by the companies that sell you the software. So that's like you know, Adobe, and uh, you're going to get the a classroom in a book or the Avid Certified course. 
you're going to get really good at this, their particular software tool, but the world is bigger than that. Next, Edit Mentor is a ramp, but not a replacement to other tools. In fact, we want you to use other tools ultimately. And finally, it works with your existing curriculum if you're a teacher and you've already got some of these lessons that you want to put into Edit Mentor. Probably the number one thing that people ask me to make is tutorial videos and tutorial blog posts. Customers ask me for that. And for years, I was like, just like, no. And then I like made a few. And, but, you know, but the reason I don't like making them is I just don't think they work. You know, I think they really work really well when you work alongside of them. So like, for example, if you guys use Video Copilot and Andrew Kramer, awesome. If you actually sit next to it and do the work and pause the video and try the thing and do the thing, right? I think Edit Mentor is great because you're being active. But if you're just watching a tutorial on you know, how to be creative or something, like that's just a waste of time. So this is Edit Mentor. This is just a browser. This is Chrome. And this is an NLE. It looks just like an NLE. It's supposed to. OK, so we've got a timeline. We can move clips around. They can snap. We can cut them. We have insert and overwrite edit. We have delete, all the basic stuff. But underneath the hood of Edit Mentor, it's designed for learning. That's what it's built for. So we have this very sneaky button here that allows you to, hang on, yeah, reset the timeline back to how it was when you started. It's actually much more impressive if I'm not that zoomed in. So I'll just reset the timeline, and there it goes right back to how it was. So the teacher can set up a timeline for you to start working, and you can't get lost. Next, everything else looks kind of the same. We've got clips. You can skim through your library. We have some buttons, you know, a timeline. But what's new is this window. And the window allows you to put in a teacher an editor needs to be able to watch a scene and analyze. And underneath, we have a description. So the lesson's going to take 10 minutes. Here's what we're going to learn in the lesson. And the lessons themselves are questions which we call challenges. So this lesson has two challenges inside of it. And are you guys ready? Because we're going to do one of them right now. Start the challenge. And I'm going to read you the description here. Watch the sequence below, delete the extra shot, submit the answer when you're done. I'm going to play this timeline now for you all. And you tell me which shot. There will be a number down here that I added to make it bigger so you can see. Does anyone want to raise their hand and take a guess at what the answer would be? Yeah. You, what you got there? Seven. seven. Does anyone else think seven? Does anyone think anything other than seven? Yeah, I mean, I didn't miss number seven. If I did, I could reset the timeline, try something else. But no, we will now submit the answer. Good work, guys. You got it right. So, not only is it now going to tell you the right answer, but the teacher can add here a description of why. You know, why is this the right answer? And if you look down at the clips, oh, I have my laser pointer. We have some answers that are like partially correct. We have some wrong answers. We've got one right one. But we could have two, three, four, five right ones. And that's because editing isn't an objective thing. It's subjective, right? So we can actually, as the students answer the questions, the questions themselves can evolve. We can say, you know what, like number two. Number two used to be it just incorrect. But so many people answered it that I've now added, shot number two is the most common incorrect answer. But if we take this shot out, we're going to have a jump cut. You know? 
And another really interesting thing when we did our sort of really basic wireframe only mock-up where it was just a clickable interface, you couldn't play the timeline, there was no timeline, everything was just a still frame. You know what the students did? Even when they got the answer right, they looked at every other answer. Why is this one wrong? Why is this one partially right? Why is this? They enjoyed it. And the part of the reason is they're interacting with it. It's not, they're not just sitting there taking a nap as they watch you know, the next video, hoping that they like absorb it. So OK, now we get our summary. And you'll notice we got a score, 6 out of 10. And that's just because we have one more challenge to do. What's really interesting about this is that score actually gets reported back to the teacher right into their LMS, right into their learning management system. So that's where they keep their grade book. And the teacher can see not just, remember data is one of those points that I'm trying to add into education. The teacher can see like if everyone in the class got the questions about how to use a wide shot wrong, then it's not them, it's me, right? But if like two kids are struggling with wide shot, then we know that just these two kids need some help with this one concept. You can pick what your lesson's about with tags. And so this, these lessons are about wide shots or close-ups and B-roll or trimming. And the reason this matters is because let's just say you have a kid who like, no matter how many times they've tried it, they get the answers to the wide shot question wrong. They can actually have Edit Mentor generate a quiz for them based on the tags of other random questions from random lessons. So you could, when you press like quiz myself on wide shots, they'll get five more questions that they've never seen before from five different movies, all with the same topic in mind, how to use a wide shot. Some of the stuff that we're putting in is a student will be able to see their score change over time so we can combat what's called the imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is when one student makes a cut and shows their parents and their parents are like, you're like the best, you're gonna be a professional video editor and they show their best friend and their best friend goes, this is dumb. Mm -hmm. And you know, one second the student thinks they really are the best and then the next, student, the next second they think they're like terrible, right? And this, by the way, happens to professionals, this happens to people of all uh, levels. I have felt it many times in my professional life, I'm sure you all have too. But having a score where you can actually see your progress is important. You can see your quizzes. And then, of course, there's gamification. So something like we're encouraging students to keep going. You know, you're on a seven-day streak, or you've tried a quiz, or you fixed a previous mistake. And I think this is cool, too. It's hard to see. But you've solved a level 1,000 puzzle, and the, or challenge, rather. And the reason I say that is because just like we don't know what's an advanced lesson, what's a beginner lesson, the challenges themselves have a score. And the score goes up and down based on the students answering them correctly or incorrectly. So we'll actually be able to know objectively what students struggle with. I really look forward to, to um, bringing this into the world. I'm telling you, it's like it's been my dream for many years. So thank you.